across the Pacific in the United States, a furor is developing. Oh. John. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that was our new introductory uh, song uh, video for the YouTube channel, The Shadow of a Bass Man. And thanks to our guest tonight, John Hallback, that that was, uh, he put that together for us um, using my slide deck. And I want to thank also um, Fall the Musical Ron and uh, Dave for letting us uh, use their song. It was just a very fitting song for the topic. Yes. They've done a wonderful job and uh, they're on, I'll put the links below for uh, their video, songs, albums. So welcome guys, it's nice to see you. Start a new year. Hello, it's great to be here. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, we're excited to be back and uh, doing our YouTube channel again. And we are so honored to have John with us today to talk about his up and coming new film, the follow up, the sequel to The Walrus called The Carpenter. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> so John, you and I, we have uh, quite a history together. <laughs> We go mm -hmm. back many decades. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've known each other for quite some time. <laughs> um, I met John probably 10 years ago, at least, when I first started out uh, researching the Paul is Dead rumor. I got onto many forums of research groups. And uh, that's how I met John. And uh, he is an outstanding researcher and an outstanding uh, film producer. So I, I'm, I'm just really glad you're here, John. Thank but you. one thing that interests me is that you are a young person, young man. And Marianne, well, we're older, much older. Um, Marianne was fortunate to be around when the Beatles were. <laughs> When they first came to the United States. But I was a wee little lass. <laughs> Just a wee. <laughs> and I was born, I was nine months old when the rumor broke here in the United States that Paul died um, in 1969. And unfortunately, I don't remember that too well. And um, so you missed out on the disco era and all the jive talking that we did. And in the 80s, um, I understand you also missed out on a fantastic band called Menudo. And if, people, <laughs> if people remember from the 80s, they were supposed to be the next Beatles. They were supposed to be bigger and better than the Beatles. And uh, it, for some reason, that didn't happen. So I'm curious, how did you become a Beatles fan, John? Right. So I was a 90s kid. Uh, so probably 
I first became aware of them around the time of the anthology, so that 95 or, or thereabouts. And my dad, uh, my dad was a music fan, so he had a big stereo setup and everything like that. And I remember he bought the uh, uh, the blue and the red album on CD. And then he also bought the anthology uh, CDs when they came out. So I remember, you know, him playing those over the the speakers, and probably at that point was when when it started for me. And then, yeah, just as I as I grew up, continuing to to listen to them. And yeah. when did, when did you find out that uh, something happened to Paul about the rumor? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I guess my actual awareness of it would have been uh, 2010 when the uh, Last Testament of George Harrison documentary came out. And I think that was a lot of people's sort of what introduced them to the, the topic, or younger people anyway. But, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think it was on Netflix at the time, but uh, I was and I was in college. And I was in my dorm room and everybody else had gone out to do something. And so I was looking for something to watch. So uh, I started browsing and I came across the, the that film. And I was like, what's this? I've never heard of this. Because by that time, I'd been into like the Kennedy assassination and a few different like conspiratorial topics. But I never I'd never heard of that. So I was like, oh, this this seems interesting. So I watched it. And when I watched it. Um, there something about it, something about the concept really connected with me on, at that point, on a level that really didn't have a whole lot to do with the actual uh, facts or historical context or anything like that. It was something I would say, even on like a spiritual level, uh, and I was hit by it and was kind of just like, hey, this is true. This really resonates, this idea. So from that point, it was just kind of like I just jumped into it and I'm still, you know, in it 10 years later. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of my official uh, exposure to it. Uh, that said, looking back as a, as a kid, I can remember that I would compare pictures of Paul from the, like the, the, the blue album and the red album. And I noticed that they look different or that something seemed different. And I would have been probably like six or seven when I did that. But that was not, I didn't rem recall that until I was introduced to the, the idea of Paul dying and being replaced. And I was like, oh yeah, I seem to remember as a kid, noting that there was something different uh, before 1966 and then after. So. That was uh, kind of the same thing with me. I watched uh, The Last Testament of George Harrison. Mm -hmm. I probably watched that three or four times and I was just shocked. Yeah. Um, but I had known about the rumor before that, you know, growing up in the 80s, and I was a big Beatle fan and uh, read all the biographies. And they always said, well, you know, it's not true. It was a hoax. You know, mm -hmm. life goes on. But there's always that one thing deep down inside when you just know something's not quite right. And so mm -hmm. you go after it after years, you know, and you, you pursue that. So, yeah, I understand. And then, um, you got into the forums and that's how I met you. Well, we were at the same time. We just didn't know our real names. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you were, were those like, kinds of people. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we- uh, I don't we, want we, anybody to know that I'm crazy enough to believe this false rumor that's hoaxing going around, but yeah, here we are. We're knowing it's not a false rumor, so yeah. in our eyes. Right. <laughs> 
So what, what was your take, Marianne, on the last testament of George Harrison? Um, uh, well, I didn't see it until after I was already, you know, um, the last few years once I realized that this was a, really a, a fact and things were not what we seemed. Um, I thought it was put together rather well. I, it, I wasn't crazy about, it sort of reminded me of, which was fitting for George, I guess, if it, you know, coming from him of a Monty Python sort of vibe to it. And, and I haven't watched it for a while, but do you know what I mean? No. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because the, the whole premise of the, the film is, is not true. Or it's you know it's not it's not George's it's actual goofy. voice you know yeah. and it's it's uh, it's very much along the lines of the traditional rumor that Paul left the studio one night angry and met it and picked up a, a lady and then crashed you know so it's it, it's interesting that that was so many people's introduction to the subject yet you know the the film in and of itself is not reflective of right you know what the exactly. reality was yeah. And it's a shame because I think then that's the perception that keeps on being perpetrated is yeah. he was actually, you know, if he was, if he is dead, he was accidentally killed. He, he drove too fast down that long and winding road through a light, whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, which I don't, I know the three of us don't agree on that. So. <laughs> is that what prompted you to write and act in the walrus? to have a more realistic depiction of what really happened to him? Yeah, so, um, trying to think of a way to, to uh, well, succinctly, uh, yeah, like I, once I was exposed to the idea, I was like, okay, how could this have happened? You know, what, what, forces could have been at work, you know, what was the historical context? And, and so, you know, at that point, I really set out on a journey to ground the whole thing in a historicity, you know, and having been connected to the JFK assassination research, uh, I, I already had a sort of a research methodology going, you know, to where I could start to look at it and see, okay, if this did happen, how could it have happened? And so I started doing that intense research. Uh, but then at the same time, I'd been making films for a few years and the whole subject really uh, resonated with me on that kind of creative level. And it was like, oh, I really would like to depict this somehow in a film. And so that was kind of the seed of, of the walrus starting but i was like i really need it i need um i need something solid in terms of like the, the historical record to kind of base the film off of uh so around 2012 um mark lane came out with his autobiography called citizen lane and for those of you who don't know, Mark Lane was an attorney and activist back in the 60s who got into JFK assassination research. Um, he went to Dallas and he interviewed a lot of the eyewitnesses and very quickly found out that, oh, what the government, the official story here is not, uh, not what actually happened. Uh, so he wrote a book called Rush to Judgment, and he also made a documentary film where he went and interviewed all those witnesses and, and got their accounts. So anyway, in 2012, um, a couple of years before he died, he released an autobiography. And in that autobiography, he talks of, me, of meeting Paul uh, in 1965 and of how Paul was interested in the JFK assassination. And he read the draft of Mark Lane's book mm -hmm. and also at that point offered to provide a music score for Mark Lane's film, which never came to fruition. But when I read that, I was like, wow, this is really interesting because it could provide a motive for why mm -hmm. Paul started to get in trouble with the establishment. And I was able to plug that into the my reading on the JFK assassination and having an understanding of 
there were a lot of people being killed at that point who were either direct eyewitnesses to the assassination or people who knew of it or people who were looking into it uh, were dying mysteriously. And um, so I knew I was like, wow, this could really this really could have been a serious thing if a beetle had come out publicly in opposition to the conclusion of the Warren Commission. And had all if he also would have provided this music score to this film, you know, so this would have been a huge thing, particularly uh, among young people. And of course, at that point, the, the counterculture was already starting to, or the anti war movement was starting to heat up. So once that, once I was exposed to that account of Mark Lane's, I was like, wow, this, this, this is a good entry point for presenting this on film mm -hmm. so that so that kind of gave me the what I needed to start writing the script and um, yeah a couple of years later um, I actually shot the film and and that was a great experience I can imagine it was very hard um, for those who have not seen the walrus I'll put that link in the description below as well um, forewarned it's it's very hard to watch and for you to act it knowing what you do what we we do it had to been hard yeah yeah um and just to go back real quick um so i knew i knew like once once i was exposed to the idea of of pid i quickly realized that oh if this happened and he was replaced this was not an accident and also the replacement aspect this was not something that the Beatles themselves had the resources to to do so i knew right off that if this happened this was something that was done to the Beatles, you know and that paul was killed for some purpose and i just had to find out what that purpose was you know um so that that quickly became apparent. So I just wanted to add that that mm -hmm. um, it it never made sense to me that if this happened, this was some kind of accident, you know. And then they just came up with this random idea to replace him, you know, so the fans wouldn't be devastated or whatever. Um, I I really picked up on a kind of diabolical aspect to it. You know, and I knew that since that, oh, this is something very dark that happened. And so that was an aspect definitely I wanted to bring into the the film. And you mentioned, you know, some of it is is hard to watch. And but I, I felt like to convey the truth of it. Oh, definitely. That that needed to to come across, you know, and so the, so the kind of the concept of, behind the film was was kind of like <laughs> I want like a slap in the face, you know, to someone going into it, not aware of the idea to say, oh, my gosh, what is this? You know, like the the claims that are being made here, you know, are insane. <laughs> and hopefully for that to drive them to look at the actual reality of it and do their own research right yeah you would hope that somebody would look at that and say why would somebody do this if it wasn't right. something that was there was a motivation for you to do it and, mm -hmm. and yeah. how do you come up the truth hmm? how do you come up and how do you come up with a replacement so quickly well, you know place in terms of like per, portraying paul you know it was a question of well do i go hire an actor or do I do it myself? You know, and, and I'd had quite a bit of experience in in performance and, and theater. Um, and I can I concluded that that I felt like given what my understanding of the the subject was and of who Paul was, I felt like, well, I I think I'll go ahead and just do it myself. Because the last thing I wanted was someone to come in and do a beetle impression you know which is a, which is when you see a lot of the depictions of the beetles on film uh 
you know, often people just seem to be doing an impression. Um, and it's easy to slip into that from a performance standpoint because of the the uh, Liverpool accent, you know, and it's a, it's a very distinct kind of accent. And it's easy to make it sound like a parody almost. Right. You know, so going into it, I was like, well, I'm I'm going to, you know, do less of that and try to emphasize more, uh, um, you know, Paul's personality and his inflection, you know, and uh, his tone, you know. So you have his demeanor down perfectly. Right. And that that was another important thing was like to to. Because, you know, a lot of depictions, obviously, of, of Paul on film, they're an amalgamation of, you know, both his characteristics and uh, Bill or Fall's characteristics, you know, so people kind of mash the two together in in their performance. So it was important for me to just to you know, just look at Paul prior to 66 and, you know, communicate his, specifically his mannerisms. And, uh, yeah. You capture that perfectly in your film. It's like you Thank almost you. can connect with his, char his character, his, the way he was. I mean, he was a very um, humble the person. Soul connection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really get to know Paul in your film. Which is so different than Billy' personality, and it shows. He really does, and he, it shows his strength of what he had to endure, and how what a strong man he was to go through all the pressures and stress of fame, and you know the death threats and all that. Now, the '66 tour was an easy on um, them, and particularly on him. Hmm. So, you did a great job portraying Paul. You really Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. And, and and also an, an important thing for me to convey was his isolation, you know, um, during that period. And so that was an important theme, and it, it'll be a theme that carries over into the Carpenter with John in his later life, because I feel like the it's interesting because those two, both on stage and in their in their dynamic on stage, and uh, but also in real life they mirrored each other and and bookended each other mm -hmm. and so that was that was the springboard into the next the next film was just wanting to do john's story you know and sort of have the two uh, parts of a whole <laughs> so can you can you give us some smidges about the next one coming up i mean we know it's about John, but that's about, I think, where we we saw, you know, the trailer you did was really good, but um, it, it it didn't tell us a lot. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know if the actual film will be any less confusing, <laughs> um, but um, so after I did The Walrus, I wanted to do um, I wanted to do more of the story. And even with The Walrus, I did an original version, which was about 20 minutes long. Then I came back and I did a longer version that was like 45 mm -hmm. minutes long. And there was more stuff I wanted to add after that. And I was like, you know, I better just leave this one alone <laughs> and like do, do another actual other film. So initially I had the concept of doing uh, Bill's story, you know. Um, and after a while, I felt like, I don't really want to do that. I mean, I, I, I feel like the world has had too much of him, <laughs> if anything, for the last 50 years, you know. So I, I, did, I really ended up, I didn't want to emphasize uh, him. So I started looking at the John thing. Now, I had, up until that point, I hadn't really ever focused on John. And in fact, I had a bit of a, an animus towards him because I felt like that he had abandoned mm -hmm. Paul, which I think still is uh, to a certain extent is true. But at that point, I, I didn't have the maturity or whatever to to look past that and want to explore who John was and his relationship with 
the real Paul. Uh, so it took a few years to, to, you know, accept that I needed to do his story from his perspective. Uh, so I started writing a script and originally uh, I wanted it to take place in 1974 during what's known as John's Lost Weekend, where he uh, left Yoko and moved to L.A. and uh, sort of uh, went crazy for a while. And so I, I thought, oh, that would be an interesting period to explore and, and what really was going on and, and all of that. So the first draft of the script was actually set in that period. And um, the other thing I wanted to do was make this one a feature length and not a short film. And that's still what it's going to be. It will be a full feature. Uh, but but so, uh, but eventually I came around to uh, wanting to focus on the period between 1977 and 1980 when John was essentially a shut-in in the Dakota. And so I, I, from a research perspective, delved into that period. And it just that was such a enlightening process. And I learned so much about him. And there was there's so much mystery, you know, mm -hmm. and things alluded to. And so it was just this fascinating, like it just opened up this question of what was he going through during this period? You know, what was he trying to process, you know? And so creatively that just opened up all these avenues in terms of like the script. So I started writing it from from focusing on that period and then ending with his uh, murder in 1980, um, which of course we know prior to John being killed, he had, was coming back into his own, you know, and he was waking up, I think is a good way to, to view it. Right. <laughs> and that process kind of started when he took a sailing trip to uh, Bermuda in early 1980. And during that trip, um, they came upon a terrible storm. And everyone on the boat that John was on, they were on this little yacht, uh, was sick, even the, the captain. And John wasn't because at that point he was on a microbic diet, you know, so he didn't get sick, you know, <laughs> uh, in the midst of this terrible storm. And so the captain was like, John, you're going to have to take the helm, you know. And uh, later on, John just describes that as this as this kind of transformative experience. And so I kind of linked into that as a sort of pivot point in the screenplay um, to where John starts waking up and accepting reality and all that type of thing. Um, and then so the film kind of follows an arc of, you know, him starting out kind of depressed and isolated in the Dakota and then going to where he has this kind of rebirth experience and then getting killed at the end. Um, so, so again, it kind of mirrors the walrus and Paul's journey to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, so I, I, the screenplay is finished. And now it's just a matter of collecting the resources and everything necessary to to actually make it. So. And you're doing a fundraiser for that, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, uh, currently doing a Indiegogo campaign uh, to uh, raise some funds just to, to help get it the actual shooting of it going. Um, so yeah, I don't know if we can include a link or I can, I will put if, the link for that down in yeah. the, in the description as well. So anybody wanting to help John contribute to, um, this new the movie, the, the carpenter, you know, you can go ahead and click on that link and I'm sure is whatever donations anybody can give is, is a help. So, well, right. I've, I've, you know, I've done several campaigns in the past for several films and, uh, there, there's, I don't know, there, there's always seems to maybe be a perception that you have to give a lot, you know, or, or, um, or that giving, you know, $5 or $10 would be too, 
uh, wouldn't be enough to make a, a difference, but actually <laughs> it does. You know, if, you know, 100 people give $10, you know, that it does make a difference. Right. So I, I would just encourage people to not, you know, just give whatever whatever you feel like you're, you're able to, to do. And it's really simple uh, to donate as well. You can use a variety of methods. Yes, we encourage people to donate um, if they can. Um, it's a wonderful film. It's going to be a wonderful film. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. To the, to the, I can't well, and, to and I'm sure with putting the link to the walrus, if anybody hasn't seen that, it, it gives them an idea of mm -hmm. what your your capability is of getting this, uh, doing this and making it. I know it's going to be as good as not, if not better, maybe than the first. You you know, more research, more time, more. Well, knowledge. yes, yes, and and the you know, as a you filmmaker, know. you know, I've learned a lot definitely in the past five years and and the walrus too was was <laughs> was done uh, very low budget and it was done um quickly and so there's aspects to it that aren't as streamlined as they should have been or um polished as they should have been so the idea with the carpenter is to you know um take a little more time and and some focus so it will be different than the walrus in that sense you know um right you know i and my hope is that it will be it will still be confusing to people but that it, it will be easier to engage with is the hope well i'm sure that then they'll maybe do some deep dive researching on their own we we ask anybody who's reading our books watching these videos um john's video his movie um other people's videos that are out there that they start you know paying attention to this narrative that we're all putting out there because it's got teeth and it needs some traction and and people need to do their own research um our books ann and i you we have we've talked about this before we can put a what a line a sentence in there that people should really you know grab a hold of and say well what's this and start looking up some information for yourselves mm -hmm. you know we can give the fundamentals and, and and hopes of people taking hold of the information and running with it a little bit mm -hmm. and john has actually helped us uh, with the two books that we have written too because we all three of us share our research together Mm -hmm. um, we're all very passionate of getting. Yeah, we're on the same page. That he died and was replaced, and this is for him, for Paul, you know, to get his truth out. So we we're a team, <laughs> and we work together. So it's an honor to work with John. He's an awesome filmmaker, and we Thank really you. appreciate you helping us out with our <laughs> intro. <laughs> to our yeah, yeah, and intro. <laughs> and I I've really I really appreciated. And because she shared a lot of uh, primary sources with me and really helped me to further, you know, solidify in my mind who Paul was, you know, how he's distinct from the person that the world currently thinks is Paul McCartney. Um, yeah, so I've, I've really appreciated that. And um, no it's been invaluable. No problem. It's, it's, I love working with you. So. Not a yeah. You know, and also I in our research, I discovered that, you know, John and Paul's relationship is far different than what's portrayed out there. Mm -hmm. They're much closer than uh, we know. Um, and when you look at his relationship with Billy, you know, there's a lot of tension there, obviously. Um, but when you go back to the primary sources and you go back to the magazine articles from the 60s and their interviews and what they actually said they spoke very highly of each other and you could tell that they had that brotherly bond and they worked yes. very well as artists and um they knew each other they could read each other's minds and i think all four of them could at some point but the bond was very tight between john and paul and i'm very very thankful that you're bringing the carpenter because that's going to show that that bond mm -hmm. is um, much stronger than um, what we understand between us. 
Well, they an important point between between them that seldom gets mentioned is the fact that they both lost their mothers and how this was an important bonding point between them. And, you know, it's something that they talked about and discussed, which, you know, according according to the current uh, uh, Paul McCartney, uh, they never talked about it, according to him, you know, and it's just not true. But again, that's that's a crucial way in which he re, uh, reworks history or rewrites it, you know, and. Uh, um, and, you know, in terms of John. You know, his is a it's a complicated story and complicated psychology. Um, and that's something that, you know, I want to explore in the film. Is him coming back to the realization of what his relationship with Paul was, you know, because yeah, I think right. there was an element of him that was in denial about everything that had happened and a desire to believe mm -hmm. that it didn't happen, you know, and I think a lot of that was associated with his heavy drug use and trying to trying to get that out of his head, you know. Um, I found fascinating. I don't want to go off on a, a side tangent, but watching the the uh, Get Back film that just came out uh, to me was very enlightening in terms of what the dynamic was between John and and Bill. Um, not Billy Preston, <laughs> Bill has <in>, no. <laughs> uh, the replacement or William or Paul or whatever, but. Uh, um, go ahead, give, uh, go ahead and go off on that tangent since we're not, I don't, we haven't talked about that or done a, a deep dive into the video yet, but I'm sure well, we will at some point. It was fascinating because, you know, people, people I know who are not sold on the concept of Paul dying and being replaced kind of felt like it was an exotic or a, a that that film was like a affirmation. Yeah, or, or well, well, it was like look, look, look at their friendship yeah. and their dynamic and yeah. everything. You know, it's like it's like yeah, I, I understand what you're pointing at, but it uh, that's that's not what John and Paul were. <laughs> you know, and that's that's part of the problem is people do not have an awareness of what their relationship was prior to 66 you know and i don't blame i mean it, it takes a lot of time and dedication and research to have that awareness uh and i it's what we're trying to do is bring that you know make it more accessible to people that hey their relationship was not what you've been led to believe it was actually this um but in terms of in terms of like get back you know um I felt it was it was very affirming to me because it was like this is this is exactly what I felt their dynamic was, you know, um, which is um, competitive, uh, you know, there being tension there, uh, being a maybe a little bit of maybe not personal respect but professional respect in in a in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, because I think one thing I picked up from it was that the George Ringo and John maybe being a little bit uh, not in awe necessarily, but maybe impressed with with Bill's ability to riff, you know, and to because he is quick. I mean, that's how he's he's that's how he's been able to do what he's done for 50 years. Um, so. And and to how you know he, he was acknowledged in the film as the leader of the group, you know. And so it's like, well, wait a minute, like this doesn't make sense, you know, if you plug it into the conventional Beatle history, right? You know, because there was, you know, there there's a bit in the film where 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 John and and Bill have a secret conversation, or it was supposedly secret, where they were recorded. And Bill's talking to John and he's like, well, they still think that that you're the leader. You know, they still look to you, you know, and just the whole the way they talk to each other, you know, the things they discuss give the impression of. OK, these people, they haven't been in a group together very long. You know, they're still figuring out the, the power dynamics. You know, they're still figuring out who can do what type of thing, you know. 
so it's like this just watching it you know i and too i try to watch it from the perspective of someone who doesn't is not bringing to it the knowledge of of what they actually were earlier on before paul died you know it's like what how can you get the impression that these this was a band that had been together for 10 years you know because you don't get that impression at all from it. Right. right. And it was Paul in 1964 that, you know, um, said that John was the chief Beatle. Mm -hmm. John was the leader of the band. He was the unofficial leader. Not that there was a leader, but if there was, you know, he kind of said, you know, <laughs> there's a leader, John, but it, they're still, they still weren't all together and they're all equals. You know, but Paul is the one that said that he was the chief beetle and he, he nicknamed him that in front of the press. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, John was the leader of the band. So in the later years, they're calling Billy the leader of the band. <laughs> A little different. So, yeah. And John also said in 1964 in an interview when he was talking about um, Paul, you know, John said that, you know, talking about Paul is like burying my soul. So that shows that he was very close to him. Right, you know, and you know, the conventional history is well. After Brian Epstein died, then Paul, to you know, stepped up and sort of. To, and I don't really, I don't buy that because, you know, what what you see and get back is a inflexible position essentially where it's like okay he is the leader now and has been for a couple years you know so it very much is the impression of this is something that was dictated to the group a situation was dictated to the group where it's like okay this this guy's in charge now you know and uh yeah there were there and there were some, some surprising moments in that that i'm uh I'm shocked we're left in because um, there's a there's a bit where George Martin refers to uh, Paul, quote unquote, as William. And there's a bit where John, a funny bit, actually, where John is uh, he's talking about the new studio set up. And he's like, boy, wouldn't it have been nice to have this in the cavern, you know, and he looks at George and he says, well, we were there, <laughs> you know, so. Little moments like that, that was, yeah. I was very surprised. That, there, were, there was that moment where George spoke up about India. And if we all went right. to India to become who we were supposed to be, you would be who you are. I don't, I can't remember exactly how he said it. Yeah. But it, it, he basically was saying you aren't who you are. And if you were to be honest with yourself, you tell people you aren't who you are. <laughs> well, and, and, the, and the bit where George leaves the group. You know, he goes up to John and says, I'm leaving the Beatles now. And John's like, right now? And George is like, yes, just get a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just get so, a replacement. Yeah. Just yeah. Them off the street. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of contention there. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised to see some of those aspects. And I know I've been, we've been busy with finishing up the, the books that we've been doing um, that I haven't gone through that step by step like I want to and do a deep dive into the get back videos. Um, there was a couple pictures that I caught and, and posted um, in our group that John, it was actually John with Bill height wise, mm -hmm. where they used to be, you know, here shoulder to shoulder, head to head. They're like, this, but there's, there was a definite big discrepancy. And, and then there was a picture with him talking to George Martin, who is mm -hmm. a very tall person. Mm -hmm. And he was not, he was like, head, you know, right there. So there was a couple of those kinds of shots that they tried to, they tried to disguise his height in some pictures, um, mm -hmm. in other aspects where he's straddling his legs out and playing yeah, yeah. across from John. So they weren't next to each other. They're across from each other, different cameras. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there were a couple where it actually did depict the height difference. I mean, you know, 24 year old men do not grow shoulders and height and stature like that. 
Right. Just the little things, they're all little things, but they all form one big picture. Well, and, you know, people uh, mentioned the rooftop concert and like, well, di didn't John and Paul have a lot of chemistry? And it's like to a, to a certain extent, but not to the level that, before. you know, they had before, which was less, there was a synergy there, an, an energetic synergy that, um, you know, after 66, you never saw again. Um, you know, and the rooftop concert, it's like, you know, they're enjoying it, you know, obviously. And that's when you play with people, even if you don't know them that well, it's an enjoyable experience. You right. know, it, it, you have to have, it does create a chemistry. But again, it's it's these distinctions that people are probably not aware of, you know. And they had been playing together in the studio for three years. Or, yeah. You know, so yeah. they had that. It's just, it wasn't the same chemistry as if you go to the lives um mm -hmm. from before mm -hmm. the reading you, you almost could tell they read each other's mind or they joked with each other the di different things that they would say mm -hmm. and that wasn't there in the rooftop performance i think they were just playing off of each other one one trying to one-up each other is more like it <laughs> mm -hmm. but what i thought was interesting is they started to do some of their early songs that John and Paul wrote yeah from the early years you know one after 909 they did it in the cavern club mm -hmm. and now they're doing it on the rooftop mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting they're bringing back some of their earlier compositions of John and Paul and that was like throughout the whole film you know you get little snippets of their early compositions but one after 909 they did it in the cavern clubs so okay they're digging up their old songs together hmm. so stuff yeah. that paul wrote back in the day mm -hmm. exactly exactly so and, and i happen to love that song too <laughs> so. mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah did anybody happen to catch this one scene or is it just me in get back where billy says where's paul did anybody catch that billy which billy uh, the replacement billy said where's paul hmm. yeah he he mocks it kind of to mm -hmm. john he points to john and says hey where's paul yeah john looked at him like why are you stupid <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did anybody catch that yeah. no but like i said i i only watched it through once and i haven't had a chance to go back and i want to go back and timestamp and go through it so we'll have to talk about that yeah because i have something to look for okay yeah i got i asked people that and they're like no i didn't catch that and i'm like I'm, it was probably I'm subtle but it was, went over <laughs> people's heads <laughs> Um, yeah, it could be. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, one thing people pointed out is like, well, how does, you know, because he's talking about, uh, Paul is talking about, you know, uh, things from the early day, like you said, like they're either their early compositions or other anecdotes, you know, and uh, I, I have to correct them and say what well what he's doing is he's riffing you know on things that he's either been told by other guys in the group or through his whatever his orientation process was but if and you pay close <laughs> well and if you pay close attention there's a little bit where john and george are reminiscing about how they used to forget half of the song on stage <laughs> or they they miss chords you know and it's a very like warm interactive moment and then all of a sudden bill jumps in he's like oh yeah remember when with jimmy nickel you know when he replaced ringo and he has this little anecdote about about something jimmy nickel did and when they were playing uh, she loves you in sweden and uh I, it's interesting because I was like, okay, that's something he obviously he watched a, vid, a film and is 
just kind of regurgitating what he saw, but putting it in in the language yeah, of yeah. the personal anecdote. Because and another thing about that was it's like, well, Jimmy Nickel would have been behind you. So and if you go watch the film of She Loves You, them performing that in Sweden, it's like, you know, they're all facing the audience. So right. how do you know <laughs> what he was doing unless you're watching a film? And another another interesting thing was there's a bit in there where Linda comes into the studio and she was like, oh, we were looking at Help and Hard Day's Night the other the other night. And it was specifically in the context of their dynamic, the group's dynamic with each other. And she was she was it was a, a really interesting aside. You know, and I, I think maybe there's a perception that back then that, oh, you know, nobody had VHS players or whatever. So there was no way it's like, no, people had personal, especially okay. well, wealthy people. They had personal projection systems and they could order, you know, a reel or a copy of yeah. whatever. Real, and real, watch, watch real, it. real. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's not, yeah, like you said, he could afford, he could afford that. That's no, that's not, not as any special piece of equipment compared to mm -hmm. soundboards and everything else that they all had. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, there were some interesting conversations there between them too. Like I said, I think it's something we should, we need to go back and look at more thoroughly. The dynamic of when Yoko would come in and Linda would come in. We were talking about Lo Yoko last night, Ann and I. So it's the, the dynamic was a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Billy knew Yoko before John did, a year before John met Yoko. So that puts Billy and Yoko together in about 65 or early 66. And Billy said oh. that. You know, Yoko used to come around to my house. Well, no, that's not true because Paul didn't move into his Cavendish home until April of 66. So mm -hmm. if you're claiming that you met Yoko a year before John did, that puts you in 65. And, and then she was at your house. What house? Which house? <laughs> Whose house? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's interesting, too. I think that Billy knew Yoko before John did. Yes, there's definitely more to Yoko than uh, than <laughs> she would have everyone believe, you know, whether or not she was affiliated with an intelligence agency or not. Uh, I don't know, but it certainly seems that she has aspects to her that seem like, you know, she was in a handler situation as far as John is concerned. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that, definitely. But she knew who the Beals were, even though. She claims she didn't. She and Linda both knew what they were getting themselves into before they knew what they were getting themselves into, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and that's, I that, that could kind of be a segue into the world of intelligence in general back then. And the way it's always been is there's intelligence families, you know. Mm -hmm. And it might seem bizarre to people, but it's like that it's... Uh, it's always kind of been that way. And um, I mean, that's something early on that when looking at, at Paul's death and how it would have happened and the replacement aspect is in the world of the 60s in particular and in the world of the intelligence services, particularly CIA and MI5, them doing this is not at all bizarre, you know? <laughs> and I think that's a big thing for people to get over who might be new to this idea is it just, it seems so bizarre, you know? Uh, especially like the, the replacement thing, you know? And how could this have been possible? This is impossible or whatever. But when you look into it, not, not for the intelligence agencies of, of that time, um, this was the kind of thing they were doing. I actually recently mm -hmm. discovered a document um, about uh, MI, MI5 using doubles in World War II and how they would give people radi radi radical uh, plastic surgery 
to change their faces so they could be, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> agents or whatever. And it's it's an actual government document with images in it of before and after, you know. So it's like this is something they were doing in the 1940s. I'm sure by the mid 60s they had perfected it to a science, you know. Absolutely. Right. Um, People cannot look at this and equate it to what plastic surgery was done by regular MDs no. back in the 60s. That's not who was performing these surgeries. Right. And there is a, um, a person who was born in Liverpool who had a sex change and uh, became a very famous actress mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the 1960s. Her name was Ashley, Adam? April Ashley. Yeah. Was it Adam? Ashley April, April Ashley, <laughs> April Ashley, I think was her name. And um, yeah, she was born a male. And in the late 50s or so, she had a, he, she he, had, a, had a sex change. <laughs> he was in the military as well, too. Right. Until she, he became the trans, trans Dover. Transgender. Right. Mm -hmm. So they were doing sex change operations in the 50s. Uh, that was shocking to me because I thought that was kind of new, um, maybe within the last 20, 30 years. But to know that they were doing that way back in at least the 50s was shocking for me to find that out. I didn't know it went that far back where they can actually. Right. Change. Well, and you almost have to think because we're hearing about people that this has been happening to from back then. Now we're, it's starting to come out that these people were transgendered as children, as babies, as whatever, um, for these specific families. Is that, you know, I know I'm bringing up another conspiracy thing. But. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's the truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, yeah. and, and we're getting more and more documentation of, of the kind of projects and operations that, that intelligence was doing back then. Uh, the recent book Chaos by Tom O'Neill that covers the Manson case. Um, you know, he studied it for 20 years and he found a lot of, you know, primary documentation of the kind of mind control experiments that were being done at that time. You know, just crazy things that, that you know, right. you'd, be, you'd be viewed as a wacko for believing, but it's like, here's the primary documents. It's like the, the wackos were the people doing it, <laughs> you know, not the people who are, are trying to uncover what they did. And, uh, you know, so. So as, as time has gone on, you know, this concept of Paul dying and being replaced is, has gotten less and less bizarre, you know. And, no, it's uh, getting legs. I think. Yeah, more and more and more just, oh, this is kind of run in the mill of the type of stuff they were doing back then, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And and talking about that, um, Ann and I is you can see on um, Ann's behind her, her her image and, and mine back here or here. We just came out with this book in the beginning of December, um, our second book in the series. And we get into a lot of the different aspects of what the government does and the mind mm -hmm. control. Um, we have a section in there about Manson in this book, but very deep dive into John's assassination um, and the circumstances. Of course, it's written in a fictitious way and through in our storyline. Um, but Anne, do you want to add into that as far as? Um, yeah, I mean, we replaced Yoko with uh, our main character, which is Paul's son that John adopted. Uh, and was raising and he was 13 at the time. So we just replaced Yoko with John's son in there. And he was the one that witnessed John, John's yeah. murder. So <clears throat> yeah, we take a deep dive into that and um, pretty much con I've con I concluded, we concluded that, you know, there was probably a second shooter. There had to be a second shooter. So that leads into, you know, just another conspiracy. Uh, and another death around the whole beetle right beetle as story. you mentioned before john there was a lot of deaths back after the kennedy assassination mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. been a lot of deaths as a paul as in the paul thing you know um 
lots. And they continued for 10, 15, indefinite. But I mean, we can track it at least from to John's death, years, 15 years difference. And then get we even can get into George at some point with his, you know, attack in his home. Mm -hmm. um, did a lot of things to keep people silent. Ringo's house catching on fire, sort of another oddity. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shots across yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like how many coincidences do you need before you start to figure out, you know, what's going, you know, these things are linked or there's a reason why these things are happening. You know, it's just like George's George's knife attack. It's like that's such a random happening, right? Supposedly, and made no sense. But once you once you plug it into um, the bigger story and see that oh that was that was right after all the drama with the anthology and um you know whatever happened there i i don't know i don't think we've got the real story but it i think it was an acrimonious enough situation and that george was making enough of a um a problem mm -hmm. that you know the knife attack was a direct result of that uh period so again, it's like things that isolated don't make much sense, but once you plug them into the large, uh, this larger narrative, it's like, oh, this kind of makes it all come together, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to get into the nonfiction book this year. Um, a lot of people have been asking us about the two books and where's the fiction start and the facts and mm -hmm. how does that separate? And if they don't go into their own research and 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 look, it, it's hard, but um, we're going to get into this aspect where we even think we could probably do two books on nonfiction because there's so oh, no. much. Yes. Um, but it, it, there again, it's like, yeah, one thing is a, it's a coincidence, but how many of those coincidences add up into this, you know, bringing in this picture? Almost like I used to like to do those puzzles where there's a little image on each piece and that image of all those little images brings in the whole total picture and mm -hmm. and i feel like that's what we're uh, we're seeing here with this whole subject matter mm -hmm. lots of images to create one big picture right it's kind of like we're trying to find paul in the big picture yeah paul mm -hmm. got lost in the big picture and mm -hmm. we just need to make people aware that he who he was and where, you know, what happened? People say, well, you know, well, anyway, <laughs> they, you know, the, the indifferent people were the ones that are halfway there and they say, but look what he's done. Well, that's fine. Well, look what Paul could have done. Let's you know, exactly right. He didn't have a chance. He had three years compared to 56. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really an unfair comparison. Yeah, it is. He didn't have a chance. So, but we're here and that's why we're here. And this is why we do what we do to get the truth out and to help people understand that this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's been quite a journey and it has brought us all together as friends. So yes. <laughs> it is a blessing in itself. Mm -hmm. And anybody that could put up with me for more than five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, any of us probably. We all can. <laughs> we all know. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so, well, so. this has been quite an interview, John. This has been fantastic. Yes, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was happy to come on and, and talk about this with you guys. And I've started reading uh, Shadow Dancing. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we actually, we even have uh, images in there, you know, John's death mm -hmm. certificate, the layout of the Dakota, you know, the shooting. So people not only are able to read it, but, you know, if they want to, you know, get some images to help follow things along, mm -hmm. uh, the hospital report. And they're There's hard so many... to find on the website. It's hard to find on the web anymore, too. Yeah. I got those years yeah. ago. 
So. <laughs> yeah, I got those years ago. <laughs> Anne's got a lot. <laughs> I had no idea until I was actually at her place and got to see the treasure trove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, that's true, John. You've been there. You know, it's like, <laughs> there's a treasure trove. Yeah. Hey, you're all welcome back anytime. <laughs> We'll get out those, you know, three reminders. <laughs> so. um. All right. So um, what's next for <laughs> either of you wanting to say last words or what's. Uh, yeah, for me, um, hopefully this year uh, we'll, we'll start shooting the carpenter and, you know, try and try and get that uh fully going because it's it's been a while since i started the you know the process of developing it and writing the screenplay and i would like to <laughs> i would like to move on to the next step so yeah again we've uh i have a indiegogo campaign going currently uh so if you feel like donating to that i I'd, I'd appreciate it and uh you know i'll be doing more campaigns in the future as well as the process goes along Okay, great. We'll be glad to have you back on anytime you want to come on, you know. Sure. You're always, sure. You're always welcome. Oh, yeah, we'd love to have you back on, John. And you can find his link on the Shadow of the Bass Band's Facebook page. Also, we have it there for John. Well, yeah. And the walrus is on our Shadow of a Bass Man .com, our website that's came out since our last video. Um, the website has links for Fall the Musical, who did the introduction music to our video um and it has the walrus link on it as well so that people can have that quick access it i know that's sort of sometimes hard to find the long extended version um and ann you and i'll be doing this again real soon i know we have shows we're going to go on as well um that we'll post here once that happens um for the new book and and i'm going to be shamelessly giving us another plug we did just put up this uh the spanish version of the shadow of a bass man this weekend and it should be added to the website soon for uh, links as well so and we've had a lot of people from the spanish community who had has the knowledge of paul and his death but they don't have the components um to link a lot of things because it's of the the language barriers so mm -hmm. it was one of those things that we felt a need to do um to put that the books into the spanish uh narrative it, everybody forgive the translation i am not speaking spanish so, <laughs> so it's uh we were dependent upon translators so yeah we did the best we could and the best we could and then yeah we're going to be do, doing shadow dancing in Spanish also in the yes. future. And then the nonfiction books and book three. <laughs> we'll put them all, we'll put them all in Spanish eventually. So yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So. All right. Well, it's been great. Love seeing you both. Having you on. And uh we'll talk real soon. We'll talk real soon. All right. Thanks again, John. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. You're welcome.